Hello, everybody. I hope we're on the air now. I hope my audio is working right. Oh, my video is working correctly. And I want to welcome you to our Thursday afternoon question and answer time. I say Thursday afternoon because that's what time it is for me. It's right now 12 noon Pacific time on the West Coast of the United States. Whatever time it is, wherever you're viewing from, I'm very pleased that you could join us. If we've never been introduced before, my name is David Guzik. I'm a pastor, even though I'm not pastoring a congregation now at this season of my life. Uh, I'm a preacher. I'm a Bible teacher. And uh, if you know me from outside of this YouTube channel, you might know me for my online commentary. The Enduring Word Bible Commentary has been available online, uh, both on our website and on Blue Letter Bible for more than 25 years. And I'll just say this, it's a Bible resource that some people find helpful. And uh, I'm very pleased that you could join us for today's question and answer time. Okay, so in our question and answer session, the way we do this is we begin with a lead question. A lead question might be left over from a previous Q&A. A lead question might um, be something that comes in by email or social media. But we're going to deal with our lead question today. We've summarized it under this phrase, is Calvinism biblical? So here's the question that came in from a viewer. Here, I'm going to read the question. I have to say I'm a bit confused about Calvinism. Calvinism appears confusing and divisive. What's to know? And we get questions like this from time to time. Some people ask about the five points of Calvinism. You know, what about it is correct or incorrect? Um, some people ask whether we lean more towards Wesleyan or Calvinistic doctrines. So let me give you just a little bit of background to the issue and my understanding of things. I think first it's important to begin with an understanding that there's a difference between Reformed and Calvinist. If you go back historically, there's many branches of the Reformation. Let me show you a quick little diagram that I drew up here. Uh, up at the top, you see the Reformation that happened, of course, in the uh, 16th century, uh, sparked by the work of Martin Luther, but not exclusively as, of course. And it's not like Luther didn't have important predecessors. He certainly did. But starting with Martin Luther, it's a good beginning point. Um, there, underneath him, you have two great branches of the Reformation, the Magisterial Reformation and the Radical Reformation. Now, uh, people largely don't consider those under the Radical Reformation, that is, uh, what are commonly called Anabaptists, even though I have to say, in my estimation, and if somebody disagrees with me on this, I'd love to kind of dialogue about this, I think that the term Anabaptist, historically speaking and theologically speaking, is almost meaningless because it encompasses such a broad group of sometimes very diverse people. Basically, a Anabaptist was anybody who didn't want to be under a state church in Reformation. That's making it a little bit too simplistic, but not too much. So you got those two great branches of the Reformation, the Magisterial Reformation and the Radical Reformation. Then under the Magisterial Reformation, you have the German branch, that's Lutheran. You, you have, the, of course, the Scandinavian one branched off from the German one. You have the Swiss branch with Zwingli and Calvin, and you have the English branch under Anglican. And again, uh, that's being a little too simplistic, but I think that it's a, a helpful idea. Now, what, what I'm just trying to say by this is that not all of the Reformed are Calvinists. Uh, Lutherans, boy, you, you, you get into quite a debate if you try to tell Lutheran that they're Calvinist. Um, Anglicans, many of them would not consider themselves Calvinists. And, and I'm not even talking about the, those under the Radical Reformation, the, the, the Anabaptists. So not all Reformed are Calvinists, and not all Calvinists are considered to be Reformed. There are some people who are mainly Calvinistic in certain aspects of doctrine, mostly what uh, systematic theology calls soteriology, how a person is saved, how we're rescued by Jesus Christ. There are some people who are Reformed in their soteriology, how a person saved, but they're really not Reformed in other things. They're not Reformed in their liturgies. They're not Reformed in their church government. They're not Reformed in their classic uh, eschatology, their understanding of the end times. 
So not all Reformed are Calvinists and not all Calvinists are considered to be Reformed. Now, for my part, I do not consider myself to be Reformed or Calvinist, although, again, I'll say it just very plainly, I don't consider myself to be Reformed. I don't consider myself to be a Calvinist, although, number one, I have learned and grained a lot from Reformed and Calvinistic preachers and teachers. I, I just have. It's, it's a wonderful thing that's been a great blessing in my life. Number two, there are many points in Reformed or Calvinistic theology that I think are really good and helpful. And for some of those reasons, I do not consider myself to be anti-Calvinist. I'm not going to number myself among them. I'm not going to say, hey, I'm a Calvinist. No, I'm, I'm not going to say that because I'm not. But I don't consider myself anti-Calvinist. You see, I have found that there is much more of an issue with how these doctrines are held than the doctrines themselves. What do I mean by how the doctrines are held? Well, if they are held in a contentious, argumentative, proud spirit. Now look, if you find anybody from any theological background, uh, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, Nestorian, uh, Arminian, Wesleyan, whatever, you, whatever it would be, if you start talking about these people and if they hold their doctrines with a contentious, argumentative, or proud spirit, it's going to spoil them and their movement. Now, that's true for everybody, but it also is true for the Calvinists. And, and Calvinists that I've had difficulty, so to speak, with, or maybe they've had difficulty with me, I, I believe that there's something of a contentious, argumentative, or proud spirit in them. Look, I, I certainly believe in predestination. I certainly believe in election. I certainly believe in God's sovereignty. I completely believe in man's inability to save himself. I also believe in the central place of God's covenants in his plan of redemption. But... I'm no Calvinist. I believe in those things, but I do not believe in those things in just the same way most Calvinists would believe in them. I have to say as well that I also appreciate uh, many Calvinistic and Reformed thinkers and theologians. Uh, men throughout church history like Charles Spurgeon, James Montgomery Boyce, Martin Lloyd-Jones, John Stott, Martin Luther, John Calvin himself, uh, and so on. I could give a long list, but I certainly don't agree with all of their theology. Now, when somebody's, you know, sort of debating or discussing doctrine with a Calvinist, I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's true to argue that Calvinists don't believe in a God of love that Calvinists don't believe in human responsibility, that Calvinists don't believe in evangelism. I certainly don't think it's helpful or true to say Calvinists are heretics. No. Now, it may be well, true, and helpfully argued that Calvinists are contradictory or they're confused on such areas. But I've seen many arguments that made in this area that aren't true or helpful. So let me talk about some points of disagreement that I may have with uh, my Calvinistic brothers and sisters. Um, core to the Calvinistic belief is that regeneration comes before faith. That you have to be born again before you believe. The idea is that you are saved before you believe. Now, I understand there's some uh, Calvinists who like to slice it really thin here and say, no, 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 actually you're regenerated, then you have faith, then you're saved. But listen, the, the bottom line is, is that you are born again before you believe. Now, friends, I, I just disagree with the basic Calvinistic approach. I don't think that's how God wants us to think about it. And, and I, I could go on with a lot of passages from the, the Bible, of course, that, that I believe support my position. And I think I understand why the Calvinistic person believes that. I don't think they're crazy. I just think that they are putting wrong priority, wrong emphasis on some different passages of scripture. So I, 
I, I disagree with that core of Calvinistic belief. Now, the Calvinistic belief on how God does his saving work in the believer is often summarized as what is known as the five points of Calvinism, sometimes called tulip. Uh, T, total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. And P, the perseverance of the saints. Look, let me be very straightforward with you. I find a lot of the debate about these five points to be tiresome. And it usually all depends on how one defines these points. I could agree, I think, with just about any of the five points if defined properly. So I, I focus more on the issue of are we born again before we believe or do we believe and then we're born again? There's another aspect of Calvinistic or Reformed theology, although there would be a split between the two camps, Reformed and Calvinistic necessarily on this, in its full expressions, Reformed and some Calvinistic systems brought over much from the Roman Catholic Church that should have been Reformed, but were not. Three examples that apply to more classically Reformed than to many Calvinists are, are these three. Number one, infant baptism. Number two, a liturgical and sacramental Ephesus. And number three, the state church. That is the idea of a believer's church was foreign to most reformers and the reformed world in its early centuries. I got to say, I believe what Charles Spurgeon said on this point. He said this, uh, quote, what a blessing it would have been in Luther's time if the Reformation had been carried out completely. Great as the work was, it was in some points a very superficial thing and left deadly errors untouched. Now, I agree with that. Uh, again, I'm not trying to take anything away from Martin Luther and the men of his generation, the generation or two afterwards. They did amazing work, but it was something of an incomplete work. So there's some things that I would disagree with there. I would also disagree with aspects of Reformed eschatology, um, or at least classic Reformed eschatology. But more than anything, I would say that our my greatest problem, when I've had problems with Calvinism, listen, there's many Calvinistic brothers and sisters I get along with famously, just wonderfully. But when I have had conflict, it really isn't their doctrines themselves, though I think that they're mistaken about some of those doctrines. In my opinion, the greatest problems has been in the way those doctrines are often held. If they're held in an attitude of smug, intellectual, and spiritual superiority, if they're held with a spirit of aggressive, divisive recruitment, then that's bad. But I'm not necessarily going to blame that on the doctrines, but I will blame it on the people who are that way. Look, there are many groups that I would disagree with at many different points but they don't necessarily have those same problems as some of our Calvinistic brothers or sisters. And again, maybe some of the fault is on our part, my part, it could be. But I believe that at least some of the fault lies on the part of those who hold Reformed and Calvinistic ideas in attitudes of intellectual superiority and with aggressive recruitment. I would say almost like a partisan recruitment to their camp or side. Now, there are a few other areas related to attitude that I sometimes find problematic among our Calvinistic brethren. Um, I, I don't like it when Calvinists will criticize the logical end of non-Calvinistic approaches. Oh, well, you're just an open theist. Well, no, I'm not an open theist. Well, that's where your belief ends. But they won't allow the logical end of Calvinistic approaches to be criticized. Again, if you're going to criticize the logical end of somebody else's uh, belief system, then you need to be open to criticism of the logical end of your belief system. But then there's another thing that I would say, and that is comparing the best of their churches or practices to the worst of other churches or practices. There's a lot of that that goes on in the Christian world. I want to compare myself to another group. So I'm going to take the very best examples of my group 
and I'm going to compare them to the very worst examples of their group. And surprising, you know who comes out ahead? I do. Friends, we need to judge righteous judgment. It's not fair, no matter who does it. All right, well, let me conclude this with some observations from a Calvinist whom I really respect. Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher of Victorian England. He famously said this. Now, by the way, that's Spurgeon right behind me. I'm a big respecter and admirer of Spurgeon. And Charles Spurgeon famously said these words. You ready for this? And I have my own private opinion that there is no such thing as preaching Christ and him crucified unless you preach what nowadays is called Calvinism. I have my own ideas and those I always state boldly. It is a nickname to call it Calvinism. Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else. Uh, Sometimes my Calvinistic brothers and sisters like to throw that down. as like this trump card. Boom. You say you like Calvin? Well, then how come you're not a Calvinist? Calvinism said, or excuse me, uh, you say you like Spurgeon. Then how come you're not a Calvinist? Spurgeon said Calvinism is the gospel. And friends, it's true. Those words are in print. Charles Spurgeon was a committed, persuaded Calvinist. And he actually endured a fair amount of opposition because of his dedication to Calvinistic doctrines. However, it's worth noting that his Calvinism is the gospel and nothing else statement was made in the very early years of his ministry. I looked it up. February 11th, 1855, to be exact. Spurgeon was 20 years old at the time. 20 years old. He had been at his London church for a year or less. At that point, this was sermon number seven in a series of 3,563 sermons. Uh, Spurgeon had some 37 years of ministry in front of him in London. So absolutely... Spurgeon was a Calvinist, and I think he was a Calvinist throughout all of his ministry. I'm not debating that at all, but I think he came to hold those doctrines with somewhat of a different attitude over time. I want you to consider some of what Spurgeon said later in his ministry. Look at this one. When a Calvinist says that all things happen according to the predestination of God, he speaks the truth, and I'm willing to be called a Calvinist. But when an Arminian says that when a man sins, the sin is his own, and that if he continues in sin and he perishes, his eternal damnation will lie entirely at his own door, I believe that he also speaks the truth, though I am not willing to be called an Arminian. The fact is, there is some truth in both these systems of theology. Well, when did Charles Spurgeon present that? Well, March 28, 1872, 15 years later more than 15 years, 18 years later, he was no longer 20. Now he was 38. Let me show you another one. Spurgeon said this, I am myself persuaded that the Calvinist alone is right on some points and the Arminian alone is right on others. There's a great deal of truth in the positive side of both systems and a great deal of error in the negative side of both systems. If I were asked, why is a man damned? I should answer as an Arminian answers. He destroys himself. I should not dare to lay man's ruin at the door of divine sovereignty. On the other hand, if I were to ask, why is a man saved? I can only give the Calvinistic answer. He is saved through the sovereign grace of God and not at all of himself. Folks, Spurgeon said that. And when did he say that? when he was about 42 years old, more than 20 years after his Calvinism is the gospel saying. Let me throw at you just one more here. He says this. I like this one perhaps best of all. We had far better, excuse me, we had better far be inconsistent with ourselves than with the inspired word. I have been called an Arminian Calvinist or a Calvinistic Arminian, and I am quite content so long as I can keep close to my Bible. Friends, Spurgeon said that when he was 47 years old. So please understand, I'm not trying to say or even imply that Spurgeon was less Calvinistic in his beliefs as he grew and matured in ministry. I'm suggesting, it would take a lot more research to really prove this, but I'm suggesting 
that as the years went on and he matured in ministry, how he held his Calvinistic doctrines changed. And he admitted that there was some valuable truth in some perspectives other than Calvinism, and he became less harsh towards them, less condemning or judgmental. I like that spirit. Look, let me just read that quote to you one more time, because I agree with this wholeheartedly. We had better far be inconsistent with ourselves than with the inspired word. I have been called an Arminian Calvinist or a Calvinistic Arminian. I am quite content so long as I can keep close to my Bible. Friends, I got to say, that's really my attitude. Uh, call me whatever you want to call. I don't know. Just doesn't matter all that much to me. But I will say this, that what I'm really concerned with is being biblical. Now, again, I'm absolutely sure that a similar concern is there with our Calvinistic brothers and sisters. I'm not trying to deny that it is. But I'm not worried about conforming to a system, whether it be an Arminian system, a Calvinistic system, whatever kind of system. I'm trying to put my emphasis on what the Bible says. All right. That's it for today's lead question. Sorry that that took a little bit longer than normal, but it was a complex question. So anyway, let me move on here. Um, continue on with a question from Daughter of the King. Uh, if salvation is faith alone in Christ alone, not of works, why do so many focus on works as if it is a determining factor of our salvation? Been listening to a free grace pastor uh, and it's making sense to me. Okay, daughter of the king, salvation is faith alone in Christ alone, but we do need to hear what the apostle James says in his letter. And I'm just going to summarize. I'm not going to read to you chapter and verse from James, but I'm just going to summarize with this idea that the only kind of faith that saves us is a living faith. Faith alone saves. That's absolutely true. But the only kind of faith that will save us is a living faith. And what is the evidence of a living faith? A living faith will show itself in works. Daughter of the King, there are people who assume that they're saved who assume that they have faith when for them, faith is only intellectual agreement with something. I'm telling you, daughter of the king, there are people who think that they're saved because they think that Jesus was a good guy. That's not saving faith. That's not living faith. That's not faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I, I, I don't know what the free gate grace cats teach about all this. I, I, I haven't delved into their work that much. Look, I'm big on the principle of grace. I have a book, if anybody's interested, Standing in Grace, which we've recently translated into Spanish and German. I'm very happy about that. I'm very big on the grace of God. But I understand this, that grace is received by faith and the faith that receives grace is a living faith not a dead one. Uh, and so it's fair to look to works as evidence of a living faith, all the while understanding that it's not those works that save us, it's the actual living faith that, well, it's the, not the living faith. The living faith receives what God has given in salvation. So I hope that's helpful for you there, daughter of the king. Um, next one also comes from daughter of the king. Don't Calvinists focus on works and sin insofar if someone is sinning in a certain way, they question their salvation. No, uh, listen, Daughter of the King, my experience with most Calvinists has been that they're pretty strong on the idea of the security of the believer. Uh, that is related to one of the five points of Calvinism, uh, the P in Tulip, the perseverance of the saints. So Calvinists are usually pretty strong on the idea of the security of the believer. They don't think, oh, you sinned, you lost your salvation. They may say you were never sinned. Excuse me, you were never saved uh, in, in relight of sin. But no, I, I just, a daughter of the king, I'm just going to say, I haven't found that to be the case. Um, next question comes from George, who asks, 
Why does God strike Uzzah dead, yet he was doing the right thing? Ananias and Sapphira were killed without mercy. In apologetics, how do we defend that God is merciful presented with both scenarios? George, I, I think you're asking a great question here. And here's what we need to understand. Both with the case of Uzzah and the case of Ananias and Sapphira, they directly sinned against the Lord and God immediately held them to account in his justice. There was nothing unjust in God's punishment of Uzzah or Ananias and Sapphira. Mercy, by its very nature, is never deserved. Once it's deserved, it's not mercy. And so God is free to bestow or to withdraw mercy as it pleases him. What should make us be filled with amazement is how merciful God usually is. The fact that God does not strike more people dead as he did with Uzzah and Ananias and Sapphira is a tremendous demonstration of his mercy. And for somebody to stand back and say, well, why didn't he show that mercy to Ananias and Sapphira? Look, that's up to God. It's not up to us. So I, I really think that people find it very easy to misunderstand and to misapprehend, to, to take into their mind what mercy is all about. If somebody were to say to me, why didn't God show mercy to Uzzah and Ananias and Sapphira? I would say, well, God is showing mercy to you right now. What are you doing with that mercy? Some of you will remember the great um, American theologian and preacher, Jonathan Edwards. Edwards' most famous sermon was a sermon titled, a Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And in that sermon, he considered a very interesting question. And the question is this, why aren't sinners burning in hell right now? Why does God let them live and walk the earth? And what, what Edwards came to in that message was that it's only the mercy and grace of God, and that should not be despised. I guess that's the way that I would say it, George. Um, I, I would bring it back to the individual and say, what are you doing? If you agree that right now God is showing you a mercy that he did not show to Uzzah and to Ananias and Sapphira, what are you doing with the mercy that God shows you right now? If you're despising that mercy, do you see how that just heaps up the condemnation of God against you? God's showing you great mercy and, and you're rejecting it. All right. Thank you for that question there, George. Next question comes from Thabo, who asks, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, did John write this to believers who had doubts about who Jesus was and what he had done? Or did he write to give assurance to believers that they can pray to God and he'll hear them uh, only if they ask according to his will? Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 reads this, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Well, what's the understanding of this? Is John writing this to believers who had doubts about who Jesus was? Uh, no, I think he's really doing it to give the believer uh, assurance and comfort in the great understanding of um, how many people were there, excuse me, a different thought crossed my mind there, um, to give them confidence in their ability to pray and the generosity of God towards them when they come in Jesus' name. Um, again, understand, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
Uh, John is trying to assure the believer of the greatness of God's love, the greatness of God's attention towards the believer. And that's not something to be despised at all. So I, I really think, Thabo, that that's the idea, that John wrote this to give the assurance to the believers. I think your, your second aspect uh, fits the purpose of the verse more than the first aspect. Thank you for that. Margaret asks, in what ways does the blood of Jesus work objectively? And how can we apply it to overcome by the blood of the Lamb? Uh, Revelation 12, 11. Is it okay to pray? I cover my car, my house, my city, the roads with the blood of Jesus. Does the blood work that way in covering cars, houses, properties, etc.? How should we use Jesus's blood in prayer? Oh, Margaret, what a great question. Thank you for this question, because I think it's something that bears explanation. Margaret, it is possible to consider the blood of Jesus in a false, superstitious way. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. There was nothing magical in the actual blood of Jesus. You need to hang with me here. I, I can imagine somebody being um, very offended by what I said, but you need to hang with me and listen to my explanation. Then if you want to disagree with me, fine. When Jesus was being crucified and the soldiers were about to pound the spike through his feet and his wrists, it wouldn't be surprising at all, would it, if some blood splashed on them? When the soldiers beat him and mocked him, don't you think that some of the blood of Jesus got on them? When the Roman soldier pierced his side and outflowed an issue of blood and water, isn't it entirely likely that maybe a few flecks of blood got upon that Roman soldier? This is what I'm trying to say. Those material drops of blood had no magical power in them to save anybody. It wasn't like every Roman soldier that got a few droplets of Jesus' blood on them was saved. When the Bible uses the term the blood of Jesus, it's thinking in terms of sacrifice, sacrificial blood. You, you'll see that idea throughout the Old Testament of the blood of the animal being applied, the blood of the animal being sprinkled. So it's using the idea of sacrifice, yes, but it's also using it as the idea of the death of Jesus. You could say this. It's shorthand or a word picture for the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. It is his sacrificial death on our behalf that saves us, not his actual physical blood. Now, his actual physical blood is certainly related to his actual sacrificial death. So I'm not trying to diminish any importance for the material blood of Jesus. Yes, it had its place, but, but it's not like it was a magical substance. But what he did in laying down his life as a sacrifice for sin, I won't call it magical, but it was miracle working, miracle working in the salvation that it brings to humanity, to those who believe to those who are chosen by God. You can interchange those terms as far as I'm concerned. Now, should a believer pray, I plead the blood of Jesus over my home. I plead the blood of Jesus over my house. Okay, that's fine. As long as you understand what you're doing, you're saying, I want the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ to be perceived and exalted and reigning at this place over this thing. As long as a believer does not think of it in a superstitious or material sense, but really what the thing speaks to, it speaks to the actual physical death of Jesus, which was a sacrifice that won salvation for all those who believe. Pleading the blood of Jesus with that understanding is awesome. But if somebody has it in a superstitious sense, then I, I don't think it avails much before God at all. So I hope that makes some sense to you there, Margaret. Um, I think it's important to make this distinction. Okay, thank you for that. Mickey asks, Hey David, for now, or so for some time, we go to a Pentecostal church. We're not growing in the faith. When we did go to a Calvary Chapel, we did grow a lot in the faith. 
But now it's some years we think we're not growing. What should we do? Go from church to church or stay at the Pentecostal church? Oh, Mickey. Good question. Look, it's not good for people to be church hoppers. I'll spend two months at this church, then two months at this church, and two months at this church, and that's, and have no rooted place. Ideally, and I know I'm speaking in ideal terms, not everybody can fit this ideal, but ideally, we are established in a congregation where our lives are connected with other people, and there's real fellowship and real accountability. That's the ideal. And having no fixed place of fellowship doesn't fit in with that ideal. Okay. But what if you're not pleased with the church that you're going to? What if you don't feel it's good for you or your family? Then Mickey, I think it's okay to change churches. And what you need to do is you just need to think, where is the circle to which I will practically travel? I don't know what it is. Maybe for you, it's 20 minutes. Maybe it's 40 minutes. Maybe it's an hour. Maybe it's two hours. I don't know. But you just need to, you know, sort of draw a circle on a map. Here's the distance to which I will practically travel and then say, what's the best church for me and my family within that circle? And look, to be honest, this takes a lot of spiritual maturity because the best church may not be necessarily the church that you like the most. <laughs> hey, some people might like some churches that aren't very faithful to biblical doctrine or, or tickle a lot of ears or whatever. So not, not necessarily the church that you like the most, though you shouldn't seek out a church that you hate just to do it. But what you need to do is, is consider what would be the best church for you and your family and uh, go there. Now, now look, let's just be very practical about this. You may leave your Pentecostal church, go to another church that you think is good. You're there for a while. Uh, and then you say, oh, it's not so good. So then you go try another. Well, th that's OK. You may you may kiss a few frogs before you find your prince. That's all right. But what you're looking to do is to settle down and to settle down to the best church for you and your family within an area that you will practically drive. So, Mickey, I hope that's helpful for you. I hope I've explained myself well. It's it's OK to change churches. But it shouldn't be done flippantly. It, it shouldn't. It's better to stay at a bad church. In my view, this is just my perspective. Take it for what you want. But I think it's better to stay at a bad church a little too long than to leave too quickly. Um, loyalty is a good virtue. So I, if you at a church that's not good for you, um, it's okay to try to find a better church. That's all right. But um, really have it that goal to settle down somewhere. I uh, hope that's helpful for you there, Mickey. Okay, Isa asks, how can I know that I have real faith indeed as I can't seem to overcome reoccurring doubts? Well, Isa, let me just say, faith is not the absence of doubt. Just because you have doubts doesn't mean that you don't also have faith. And so I would just say, challenge your doubts according to your faith. Look, we're all familiar with the idea of sort of challenging our faith. Hey, you believe that. Why do you believe that? Those are great questions to ask. Have you considered why you believe that? And maybe you should reconsider. Okay, great things to consider. But we should also do the same thing with our doubts. So Issa, this is what I want you to do. I want you to question your doubts. When you start doubting something, say, hey, what good reason do I really have for that doubt? Do, do it, is that really valid? Do I really have a good reason to doubt that? And deal with your doubts um, as well as dealing with your faith. But Issa, please understand, faith is not the absence of doubt. Sometimes faith is seen by our faithful clinging to the Lord even in the midst of our doubts. All right, hope that's helpful for you. Juan asks, Hi, Pastor Guzik. Can you explain 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 14, and 2 Corinthians 6, 
14 through 18 in light of each other. All right. The verses seem to contradict each other regarding separating divorce and what is sanctified or unclean. I'm looking for some guidance on the context of both after having read your commentary. Okay, one, let me see if I can get this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, he says, But to the rest I, not the Lord, say, If a brother has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And if a woman who has a husband who does not believe, he's willing to live with her, let him, her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Husband, Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. Okay, now 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as it is said. Um, I will walk among them and be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. All right, well, Juan, I think I can explain this pretty straightforwardly. First of all, you need to understand that the Second Corinthians chapter 6 passage, though it does speak in principle to the subject of a believer and an unbeliever in marriage, that's not what it is specifically written about. Uh, but it does speak to that in principle. It's kind of funny. That's one of those passages that for some reason, maybe it's a crazy reason, maybe it's a good reason, I don't know, but for some reason, Christians have really kind of latched on with the idea that that's all Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 about being unequally yoked. It just matters who you marry. And, and really, um, Paul isn't talking about marriage in 2 Corinthians 6, but that principle has application to marriage. So, okay, th that can be understood there. So, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul was dealing with people who they were married to an, you know, they were just married. They, before they were a believer, they were married. They became a Christian. Now they find themselves in a marriage with an unbeliever. What should they do? There were some people in the Corinthian church telling them that they would be more holy. They would be more spiritual if they just uh, left their unbelieving spouse. Paul says, no, no, no. Marriage is good. You have no idea how God may use you in your marriage. Stay in there. That's what Paul was saying to the, the uh, Corinthians there. The counsel of don't be unequally yoked, insofar as it applies to marriage, applies to those who are not yet married. That's where it's valid to say, don't yoke yourself with an unbeliever. But for those who uh, are already married, if you're married to an unbeliever, then you should hang in there and to the best of your ability, see if God can make it work. So, uh, Juan, I hope that explains it to you. Um, there really are talking about some different contexts between the two. Uh, but really, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 deals with those who are already married. And the principle of 2 Corinthians 6 applies to those who are yet to be married. Hope that's helpful. Next one comes from Tunnel Banan Shugotre uh, from Sweden. Hello from Sweden. Are the demons, the people in hell, the Pharisees who blaspheme the Holy Ghost and the ones who take the mark of the beast, the only creatures that can never be redeemed? Um, well, yeah, I, I would say so. Tunnel Banan Shugotre, I would say that's true. Um, Look, ultimately, to not be redeemable is to, in this life, permanently, repeatedly, decidedly to reject Jesus Christ and, and what God is... Now, I'm leaving out of this the whole question of what about those who have never heard of Jesus. That's another question. But those who consistently, persistently doggedly, to use a word, reject the person and work of Jesus Christ, especially what he did for him on the cross, there's no salvation for them. So they, they can't be redeemed. In a sense, 
redemption is offered to them in the person and work of Jesus Christ. They just reject it. So, yeah, those people that you mentioned, demons, people in hell, well, the Pharisees who blaspheme the Holy Ghost, um, I, I think the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the settled rejection of the Holy Spirit's witness about who Jesus is. And those who take the mark of the beast, that would also be an expression of the settled rejection of Jesus. So, yeah, as, as far as we know, uh, those are the ones who cannot be redeemed. Hope that's helpful for you. Hey, do. Okay, Christopher asks... Uh, the baptism stated in Romans 6, 4, is it the baptism of the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist and Jesus told us would take place? Or is it the baptism right that Christians practice? Oh, boy. Christopher, I'm going to give you my answer to this. Um, my answer to that is somewhat out of the mainstream. I believe the majority Christian interpretation of that is that the baptism... Well, let me read Romans 6, 4 to our audience. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Okay, if I could speak technically, and again, I, I'm going to agree that my response here is somewhat out of the mainstream, so if you want to disagree with it or somebody else, that's fine, but let me just say it. I believe that the baptism spoken of here in Romans 6, 4 is our baptism into Christ. Our radical identification in him, which is illustrated by water baptism. So what saves us is our radical identification in Christ. We're identified in him and he identifies in us. He takes our sin, we take his righteousness. There's another passage in Romans where Paul uses that exact phrase, baptism into Christ. Now, I regard the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be something related yet different. So I believe there's three baptisms that can be spoken of and, and maybe more than three if you really want to get into it. And I believe that there's at least some distinction. I'm not saying that there's no overlap or connection. No, there obviously is. But at least there's some distinction to be made between baptism into Christ, water baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I would say that what's being spoken here in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, is the believer's baptism into Christ by faith, which is connected to and illustrated by water baptism. That's how I would say it, Christopher. Um, and again, I believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a associated yet distinct thing. All right. You asked for my answer? That's my crazy answer. I, again, I'm a little self-conscious that it's out of the mainstream of what is uh, what most people have taught, but that's how it makes the most sense to me. All right. Hope you like my Blue Letter Bible Cup. God bless the guys at Blue Letter Bible. They were the first ones to put my commentary online. And Blue Letter Bible is a tremendous ministry. So I recommend it highly to you. The amazing Bible resources that are available at Blue Letter Bible. All right, next question comes from Connor, who asks, Today I felt drawn to God, and I've accepted him into my heart, but I was wondering what our Lord's name is. Uh, I believe Jesus Christ is the living Lamb of God and that he's come back to us and take those who accept him to heaven to worship him for all eternity. I just don't know who he is. Is he Abraham's God, Yahweh, or is he named differently? I wish to know so that I can better understand my father. Well, Connor, God bless you. Thank you for your question. And this is what I think you'll find as you read the Bible and put it together. There is the God-revealed in the Bible, especially in the Hebrew Scriptures, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush. That God, one God, is a triune God. 
He's one God in three persons. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit perfectly represent, uh, and not just represent, perfectly display, manifest, if you want to say, in some sense, the triune God. They are all God. So, yes, Jesus Christ is Yahweh. God the Father is Yahweh. God the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So, the God you read about in the Bible, especially in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, that is the God manifested in Jesus Christ. I don't know if that's exactly what you're answering there, but if you want to know what God's like, Connor, and I'm so happy that you do want to know what God's like, read your Bible, read the Gospels. Now, don't only read the Gospels, because there's so much else in the rest of the Bible that tells you, but a great place to start and really let your heart take anchor is in the Gospels that tell us who Jesus is. And Jesus said this, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Jesus is the perfect representative of God. You will not find any uh, incongruence, nothing that doesn't match between who God is and who Jesus is. So, yes, that's the God you're pursuing. That's the God you want to know. That's the God who loves you. That's the God who saves. Put your trust in him. Connor, I'm so happy to hear it. Lord, I pray that you'd bless Connor as he seeks you to know you better, to know you more deeply. Pour out your spirit upon him and bless him in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right, let me go on to the next question from Asia, who asks, Manasseh repented his sins and God forgave him. Why does the Bible say that Judah went to captivity because of the sins and bloodshed Manasseh committed? Oh, Asia, may, may I just pause and say, we have the best audience. Look, I, I don't know about all the other guys who do YouTube question and answer, feedback and stuff like that. I, I don't know if I've got the best question and answer show, but I think I got the best viewers, the best audience. You guys ask the best questions. Asia, this is a great question. Thank you for asking it. Okay, Asia, what we have here is the difference between sin and the consequences of sin. God can forgive a person's sin, yet that person may still have to face consequences for their sin. The Bible says God forgave Manasseh. I believe you're going to see Manasseh in heaven. His sins were forgiven. However, the incredible ungodly reign of Manasseh for so much time had terrible results in the land, in the kingdom of Judah. And it meant that judgment would come because of it. So really, Asia, it's a pretty simple distinction, though it's not always easy for us to grasp. And that is the distinction between the guilt of the sin and the consequences of the sin. Somebody explained it to me this way. This is kind of a down-home way to understand it. They talked about sin being like a nail that you pound into a board. Well, you can remove the nail. That's like forgiving the sin. But there's still a hole in the board. The hole can be thought of as the consequences. Now, look, sometimes God, in his grace and his mercy, he fills that hole. Sometimes God, in his grace and his mercy, will relieve a person of the consequences that their sin deserves, but not always. And God is never unrighteous to let us face the consequences that our sin has deserved. So really, Asia, that's how I would make that distinction. And thank you for asking that question. Um, if I could illustrate it just this one way, it would be something like, um, uh, let's say I, st I stole somebody's car. I stole their car. Um, I got arrested. Uh, I'm put on trial. I feel really bad. I ask God to forgive me. God could legitimately forgive my sin of stealing the car, yet I still got to go to jail. Uh, again, because there's the forgiveness of the sin and then there's the consequences of the sin. All right, next question comes from Janet, who asks, Pastor Guzik, a question, please. Do the dead know what is happening on earth? I'm thinking of the saints asking God how long until they're avenged and the rich man and Lazarus. God bless you as we learn a lot from these Q&As. Janet, 
I would put it like this. The Bible doesn't tell us enough to really answer that question. There are some hints, and you mentioned two hints. Uh, Again, the hint of um, the rich man and Lazarus, that story that Jesus told. The the story of um, the people in heaven, uh, the, the martyred dead from the Great Tribulation, asking God how long until they're avenged. They, they seem to have a sense that it hasn't been avenged yet. Um, I'll add one more. Uh, boy, it was in my mind a moment ago, and now it's leaving me. Uh, oh, the, the, the picture in Hebrews that suggests that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. A- again, it doesn't specifically say it, but it suggests it. So the the main problem people have with the idea of people in heaven being able to see what happens on earth is they think, how could it be heaven for me if I saw the problems that my son or my grandson was having down on earth? It wouldn't be heaven for me. I'd be stressed out. I'd be stressed out over my niece or nephew or grandson or whatever. And I think that's what bothers some people. I'll just leave it at this, Janet. Maybe in heaven we'll have knowledge of what's happening on earth. But if we do, it will be without a single bit of anxiety because we will have the perfect peace of knowing that all things work together for good and that God's providence is reigning over all. I don't think we have enough biblical evidence to answer that with any kind of certainty. Like I say, there are hints, but not much more than hints. So, Jan, I wish I could give a more satisfying answer. You, you've pointed out very well the hints that point in that direction, but I think we'd have to admit that it's those aren't clear enough statements to really kind of settle the issue for us. I give a great big maybe, and if it is a maybe, it's maybe with a lot of peace. Okay, next question comes from C, who asks, A new church I'm considering has a married lesbian couple that's open about their relationship. Is it my job to ask the pastor about this before joining? Paul certainly would have said something. What should I do? Okay, C, um, yes, it's absolutely fair for you to ask the pastor about that. Now, I have no idea what the pastor might say. Uh, maybe, again, I, I don't know anything about the situation. I'm just thinking of things in my head. Maybe the pastor would say, look, that couple's just been coming here for a few weeks. They're not believers. Uh, we know they're not believers. And uh, we're trying to win them to Christ. M- maybe that's the, the situation. M- maybe it's some, I, I don't know whatever the situation would be. But see, it's a completely fair question to ask. And, and this is kind of the question. How does this church deal with those who are in open, evident sin? Churches should have a mechanism where it deals with people, it confronts them, those who are in open, evident sin, who claim to be a part of that church family. Now again, we're not talking about judging people on the outside. No, no, no. But the Bible says that believers should be judging those who are on the inside, so to speak. And part of that judging on the inside is being able to say, look, if you're part of our church family and you are in open, evident rebellion against God, in love, we're going to talk to you about it. And we're going to try to to, to work with you on this, to, to bring you as a place of your discipleship into a much better place. That is entirely good and fair to do. So see, the bigger question is kind of what does this church do about church discipline? It's bad when churches allow open, evidenced sin to flourish in their midst with no confrontation about it. Now, let let me me just say this, though. Churches don't have sin detectors 
that people have to walk through. You, you, you know how when you're going to go on an airplane flight, you got to walk through a metal detector? Churches don't have sin detectors at the front door. W- wouldn't that be interesting if they did? You know, if the sin level's bad enough, it gives a whoop, a beep or something. But churches don't have that. So if there's hidden sin, it's bad, but the church can't do much about it. What the church's responsibility is to do something about open evidence sin. And, and, um, it's okay to wait a little bit to see what the work of the Holy Spirit and the Word will do. Um, look, if an open lesbian couple came to a church that I was pastor of, and, you know, it's just kind of clear and evident that's who they were and that's where they were at, uh, I would no doubt speak to them, confront them, but, but not the first week they walked in. I would be like, hey, let's see what the Lord might do. Because there's been some glorious occasions where God has just spoken to them through the work of his word, through the work of the spirit. And it's just been a beautiful, powerful thing. Um, so it's okay to give at least some period. And that period of time can be debated. But but it's good to do that. But it shouldn't be forever. Um, I, I guess I'm kind of talking in circles here. Hope that's okay for you there. Okay, uh, that was C. Another question from Adonis. What scripture would you use to show that belief in once saved, always saved, or eternal security is not required in order to receive life? Okay, well, Adonis, I, okay, let, let's just assume, by the way, let me just be transparent with you guys. I don't like the phrase once saved, always saved. I don't like that phrase. It's not a phrase that I find in my Bible. I don't like it. Um, if somebody wants to use the phrase truly saved, always saved. Okay, great. I'm I'm more comfortable with that, even though that's not a Bible phrase either, but I'm more comfortable with it. Uh, so, Adonis, I was talking with my son about this last night. I have a pretty generous area in my mind for the things that a person can be wrong about and still be a Christian. Now, it's not unlimited. Uh, obviously, you, you've, you've got to be at some level of truth regarding the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's obvious. But if we were to take it that truly saved, always saved, the ideas of eternal security, if we were to take those as true, and say, well, if somebody's wrong about that, can they still be saved? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those aren't core issues of Christian doctrine. And I'm pretty generous about the things that people can be wrong about outside the core issues of Christian doctrine and still be saved. So that's the way I, I just think about it. Thank you for that question. All right, we're past the top of the hour, and now we come to our lightning round. Throat's a little sore. Let me take another drink here. And then I'm going to try to get through these quickly. Ready? Thank you, moderator, for our lightning round. Or maybe we're calling you producer these days. Producer. Okay, lightning round from Bill. David, is it biblical that a pastor or his wife label himself or herself as an apostle? Um, No. Uh, Although more than it not being biblical, I can understand how somebody could make a biblical case for that. Uh, the word apostle means special ambassador. This person's a special ambassador of God's work, this and that. So I understand how somebody could make a biblical case for that. However, we live in a practical world. And let me just be very straightforward with you. Nobody can give or receive the title of apostle without getting weird about it. That's just how it is in the world today. Period. I mean, to me, that's just a principle that just doesn't change. Nobody can give or receive the title apostle without it getting weird. So, no, avoid it. I would avoid it. I don't think it's wise. More, I I don't like the biblical case for it, even though you can make a distinction, capital A apostles, lowercase letter A apostles. I understand that. You can make that case, but even more than it not being biblical, I don't think it's wise. Next question from Laura, who asks, How come the Gospels don't include a Gospel written by Peter? Laura, they kind of do. 
By long church tradition, Peter was the main source for the gospel of Mark. Uh, not the exclusive source, but if you read the gospel of Mark, kind of understanding, oh, a lot of this is the story through Peter, it makes sense. So I would say this, it kind of does. Next question, uh, Molly asks, if a Christian does sin and is going to ask forgiveness, but dies before asking, do they still go to heaven? Um, yes, Molly. And I think I would base it on your thing of, and is going to ask forgiveness. In other words, they've already repented in their heart. They're, they're, they're intending to do it. It's on the way. So yes, God would see that heart intention. Um, not, that doesn't last like forever. You can't say, well, I had the heart intention 20 years ago to ask forgiveness. I never got around to it. No, no, that doesn't count. But in the scenario you describe right there, Molly, I would say, yes, um, that person is going to heaven. Um, Laura asks, why in the Old Testament do people live longer than people in the New Testament? Well, Laura, there's a lot of different ideas behind that. Some people think that the numbers are wrong. I don't think that. Uh, some people think that the numbers are just kind of crazy, that they represent months or weeks instead of years. I don't really buy that either. Uh, I believe that people just lived unusually long before the flood. There seems to be a radical change in the ecology of the earth after the flood. And I think that those radical ecological changes resulted in a rapid decrease of the lifespan of man. So I have no problem saying that just in the pre-flood, you could call it the antediluvian world, uh, the antediluvian world, that people just lived a lot longer. I'm very comfortable with that explanation. Uh, now I know asks, books as, such as Kings and Chronicles always end with the sentence, he slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. Where is this place nowadays? Are there graves there still? Um, the city of David is Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem is still there. Uh, the graves are pretty much unknown. You can go to places in Jerusalem that say, well, this is the tomb of David. This is the tomb of Absalom. Is it there? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but uh, the city of David is Jerusalem. And there are at least the claimed burial places of some of these kings there. Spades asks, who are the kings of the earth of Revelation 21, 24? Are there people who are not living in the new Jerusalem? Um, Revelation 20, 20, 21, 24, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its lights and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. No, I think that those are, if you want to use the term saved, redeemed kings of the earth who honor God in that way. So, uh, no, I don't think that those are kings of the earth who are not saved. They're not like visiting from hell or something like that. So I hope that answers that for you, Spade. Uh, Debbie asks a question. How do you feel about the seven day creation event foretelling that at the end of times to be about 6,000 years after Adam and the seventh day being the thousand day millennium? Thank you. I appreciate you. Well, thank you, Debbie. I'm grateful for that. Uh, Debbie, um, I give that a great big maybe. Look, one of the things that we assume about the age of the earth, if you take what's sometimes known as ushers chronology. You, you know, you just go back and you say, well, creation happened somewhere around 5,000 BC, 6,000 BC, something like that. The one significant problem with that is 4,000 BC, maybe that's it. The one significant problem with that is there may be generations skipped. So I, I tend to be a young earth creationist uh, but I'm not necessarily a 4,000 BC creationist. N not at all. I recognize that there could be some generations that are uh, skipped over in the biblical record. That's entirely possible. So that that's how... I I'm not saying it's certain. I'm just saying it's possible. So th that's how I'd answer that, Debbie. Uh, next question from Jerry. Can a man and woman who desire to get married do so publicly in a church service but not get a license from the civil authority? Jerry, you're asking me. I say no. I would define marriage as this, as the coming together of a man and a woman in the way that is recognized and legally binding in the culture that they live in. So I, I want you to know, and again, I, I may be out of the mainstream with this, I regard in some sense 
the legal wedding as more important than the church wedding. Uh, because it is the one that says to the surrounding culture, we are committed to each other. We're committed to each other legally. We're committed to each other in the covenant of marriage. Now, it is, of course, very important to make that vow before God. That's what the church wedding is supposed to do. But it also has to be made in the culture where that happens, in different cultures, different places, different laws concerning that. But whatever are the laws in the particular place that they live, I think that a real wedding, a real marriage is done according to those principles. And Smitha asks uh, regarding John 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 6, Somebody was feeding him for 38 years, but did not push him into the water when the angel stood at the water. What was his real problem? Uh, was that his real problem rather than his sickness? Uh, okay, well, Smitha, I don't think that he lived there at the Pool of Bethesda all those 38 years. I think that there were seasons when he was brought out to the Pool of Bethesda uh, because um, the water had been stirring. Now, he had been in that condition... And simply what he did for a living was he was a beggar. He was just a beggar who would uh, rely on the generosity of other people. And that's what he lived on. But he did not live poolside, so to speak, for 38 years. No, that, that's not the accurate way to think of it at all. Um, no, his real problem was uh, he needed to have his sins forgiven. He needed to be healed by Jesus. And when he was, he gave a beautiful testimony. He had the power of Jesus to heal. All right, folks, that's going to be it for today. Thank you for joining us on today. A little bit um, longer. Oh, wait, we got one more that's come in on a super chat. Thank you, super chat. I'll answer this question last of all. David, there are a few non-believing co-workers who I'd love to invite and host Bible studies with, but I'm always afraid of doing something out of God's timing. This one fear stops me from evangelizing. Dear brother or sister, I'm going to pray that God gives you the boldness to just do it. Now, dear brother or sister, let me just tell you, you might be wrong. Maybe it's not the right time, but you'll never know until you do it. And you know what? If it doesn't go great because it wasn't the right time, God knows your heart and knows that you did this just because you love these people, you want to see them come to Christ, you want to honor Jesus in everything you do. Look, when, when, you, when you really sense that your heart is right, your motives aren't mixed, you have the opportunity, go for it and be bold. Don't fear that if you have something wrong, God's going to curse you, because he's not. He loves you, and even if you got the timing mixed up, God loves that you were bold and stepping out in faith. I'm going to pray that God gives you that boldness. Lord, give this dear brother or sister boldness in what they do. Thank you, God, uh, for the opportunity you give us. And I know you've put it on their heart to do this. They just want to know from you the right timing. And Lord, uh, unless they receive some other kind of inclination from you, I pray that they would do it soon. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for joining us, God willing. And if I live, I will be with you next Thursday at the same time, 12 noon Pacific. God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be with you.